Good morning, Good and, welcome, morning. and welcome to worship. We're here at St. Philip Lutheran Church for the Contemporary Service in Raleigh, North Carolina. We welcome all of you that have shown up today in person, and we also welcome those who do view us online. I have a few announcements this week. Um, if you are interested in the ladies' lunch that occurs the first Thursday of the month, that happens this week, um, they're going to Briggs Great Beginnings on Creedmoor Road, you will need to contact Claire Mueller to make a reservation. Her number is in the BBN. And since we are in the season of Lent, we will be having the midweek Lent services on Wednesday. We are again using the day worship service. It'll start at 6.30. It's a 20 to 30 minute service. It is very contemplative and prayer centered. And as we did last year, one time it'll be held in the main sanctuary, one time it'll be held here in Kepley Hall. So if you come and you can't remember where it is and it looks like no one's there, check the other worship space. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if you didn't get a chance to pick up the Lenten bull, um, devotional things, they were on the back table there. Um, I would ask you to do that, take it down. Um, Howard and I picked them up last week and we have started it this week, we do it together. And it is a journey through the Gospel of John. So we like the devotional part, plus also we're going to get kind of an overview of John. So it's kind of a double thing and we, en we are enjoying that ourselves. So I recommend that to you, they are there and if we run out, there are more up in the main narthex, I'll find them for you. And our other is the uh, 60th anniversary. This year, St. Philip is 60 years old. We are planning a couple celebrations throughout the year. If you're interested in helping in any way, please contact the office and 
will get you plugged into the group that's doing whatever might interest you. Okay, also, here at Crossing, we are in need of a few other people. We can use band members, we can use people at the tech table, we can use someone that stands here. All you need to do is just read the slides on the back TV. There will, we can help you and walk you through anything, so if interested in serving in some way, just reach out to us and we'll get you signed up. I'm also looking for people just to be ushers and to help set up. The yeah. So just, if you don't want to be right in the front, it's really easy to be in the back. Thank you, yes. That definitely do need that. Okay, does anybody else have anything they would like mentioned at this time? Okay, then I ask you to stand as we begin our worship. God of love, hear the cry of those who yearn for love. Fractured families, broken homes, neglected, unwanted, alone. God of love, hear our prayer. God of justice, hear the cry of those who yearn for justice, persecuted and oppressed, exploited, ill-treated, broken. God of justice, hear our prayer. God of peace, hear the cry of those who yearn for peace in battle zones and broken states, frightened, fearful, anxious. God, God of peace, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of healing, hear the cry of those who yearn for healing, physical and spiritual hurting, weakened, depressed. God, God of healing, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God of mercy, Hear the cry of those who yearn for mercy, convicted, in need of grace, contrite, humbled, bowed down. God, God of mercy, hear our prayer. May we all know the peace of God, the love of God, the justice of God, the healing and mercy of God, this day and all days. Amen. Jesus began his ministry to the world, led by the Spirit into the wilderness. As we begin our Lenten journey, let us be led by the Spirit, even into uncomfortable places. In those 40 days and in that place, Jesus was faced with hunger, doubt, and temptation. As we seek to follow Jesus, we would be led even into the uncomfortable choices. Jesus left the wilderness, faithful and obedient to God, rejoicing in the one in whom he trusted. As we continue on our path to faithfulness, we will be led by our Christ, rejoicing in the Lord our God. Amen. Amen. Our scripture reading from today comes from Genesis, uh, part of chapter 2 and some of chapter 3. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the God, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. from dust, please don't 
Please stand for our confession. Facing temptation, Jesus refused to turn stones into bread. Facing temptation, we too often turn bread into stones. Facing temptation, Jesus refused to use power for his own sake. Facing temptation, we too often take power that belongs to someone else. Facing temptation, Jesus refused to test the promises of God. Facing, Facing temptation, we too often want God to do what we should do ourselves. When God called your name, God called you to a journey of faith. Do not be afraid to look inside to see those things which are holding you back from being who God created you to be. Place your trust in God who is always with you, loving you into wholeness. Amen. Amen. God has received us, pardoned us, and loved us. Let us forgive each other in love and share the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Let's go to the band first. Yeah. Band first. Yeah. Me too. Good, peace for me. <laughs> I'll hand him my mic back. <laughs> God's peace done. <laughs> God's peace. <laughs> I'm not going to tangle somebody up in this yet. <laughs> God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. God's peace. My man. God's peace. Definitely. God's peace to you too. We've been zigzagging. God's, God's peace. God's peace, Margie. God's peace. Yeah, God's peace. God's peace. <laughs> Oh, I think there were people we didn't get signed in here. Not good. All right. I'd like to ask the children to come forward. Scoot back a little bit. I need room. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I think I'm okay on communion. We're still just under 40. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. That's all right. All right. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. There we go, we got more kids coming up now. So imagine that your mom has placed two baskets out on the table. One bowl is filled with beautiful fruit like this of apples, oranges, plums, and pears. And the other bowl is filled with candy, 
Yum, yum. Look at all these goodies in there. Yeah, after, after putting these, these baskets out on the table, your mom says, you can't eat any, you can eat all of the fruit from the bowl that you want, but you can't have any of the candy. Because <laughs> the, the fruit, <laughs> the fruit is good for you, and it'll make you healthy and, ge and strong. But the candy, it's, it's not healthy for you, and it'll give you cavities. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure you've probably figured out by now, whenever someone tells you you can't do something, what's the first thing you want to do? Yeah, do what you're told not to do, right? Yeah, and that's what, that's what our reading is about today. So as we heard in the reading, God, he, he created everything, and then he placed Adam and Eve in the garden to take care of it, and he told them you can eat any fruit from the tree in the garden except the tree in the middle, and you must not eat any of the candy from that tree, or you'll surely die. So what did, now there's a snake in there, and the snake is very clever. So what do you think the snake said? Yeah, did he try to convince Adam and Eve to eat the, the candy off the tree in the middle? <coughs> do you have voices? Do you have voices in your head sometimes when you're told not to do something? <laughs> that one, one voice says, oh, it'll be fine. Go ahead and do it. And the other voice is like, no, no, you shouldn't do that. Right? Oh, it's all of that. Ugh. But, yeah, so the snake convinced Eve to eat from the fruit from, from the tree of knowledge. And then she gave some to Adam, and Adam also ate some of the fruit. Yeah, and it opened their eyes, and they, and they realized that they were naked and they needed to clothe themselves. So much like if you eat the piece of candy, what do you do? You try to hide the evidence, right? <laughs> yeah. So they, they clothed themselves in figs. So, so that's the story of Adam and Eve and how they were tricked by the sneaky snake. And I'm sure you know the rest of the story, but Adam and Eve were punished. Mm -hmm. Did they get in trouble? Time out? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we face temptation every day, but God wants what is best for us, and he will help us to resist the temptation, and that if we do what he tells us, right? If we do what he tells us, he's going to help us resist that temptation. So let us, let's pray. Hey God. hey, God, help us to follow your teaching, and do what your word tells us to do. We know that we will sometimes fail, we know that we will sometimes fail. so we ask you to forgive us, so we ask you to forgive us. and set us on the right path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on. 
Good morning. We uh, grieve and mourn the passing of our own Chuck Wolf. Uh, I presume that all of you have received the news by now. Um, logistically speaking, uh, his visitation, visitation with the family will be on Thursday, March the 9th from 4 to 8 p.m. Uh, here on our campus in Luther Hall. Uh, the funeral will be the following day, Friday, March the 10th at 11 a.m. Uh, following that, there will be a luncheon. Um, <clears throat> the Bible uh, says that when one member suffers, all suffer together. And when one member is honored, all rejoice together. So, Cindy, we are in this with you. Uh, we will walk with you and love you and accompany you uh, all the days of our lives together. We're glad, glad you're here. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your holiness. We thank you for the promise of eternal life, which you testify to over and over in your word. We thank you, Lord, for who you are, who you have created us to be and called us to be. Uh, we thank you that we are not alone in our life's journey, uh, but we have you and most of all, we have you through each other. So we thank you for this body of saints, this family of Christ here in this place. Comfort and console all of us. Thank you for being our rock and our redeemer. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>
My sermon today is from the Old Testament, uh, first lesson assigned to this Sunday, Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. My sermon title for today is based on chapter 3, uh, verses 5 and 7, where it talks about your eyes will be opened. So my sermon title for this morning is Eyes Truly Opened, Eyes Truly Opened. During the years I've been preaching since my ordination, I have preached most frequently from the four Gospels, uh, that is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Since they tell the story of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that comes as no surprise. I suspect that that is also the case for most, if not all, Christian preachers. Other than that, however, I have preached most frequently from the books of Genesis and Acts. I never really thought that much about that. I just thought they had the best stories until one day someone pointed out to me that they were both books of beginnings. Genesis in the Old Testament narrating the original creation of the world and the human race and Acts in the New Testament narrating the beginning of the Christian church after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. I think in many ways, many of us, even if subconsciously, are trying to get back, to go back in time and space to a simpler time, a more innocent time, home, however it is that we might define that. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, opens majestically. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving over the waters. God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw that it was good. There are really two different creation accounts in the opening chapters, purporting to come from two different sources. Uh, The first account of creation from the opening words, that is Genesis 1-1, through chapter 2, verse 4. And the second account from there, chapter 2, verse 4, through the end of chapter 3. There are subtle differences in tone, style, vocabulary, etc. But perhaps the main difference is where humankind falls in the order of creation. You see, in the opening chapter, humankind is created last, after everything else. While in the subsequent chapter, humankind is created first, before, for example, vegetation and animals. Our text this morning, whose details are a little more filled out, comes from the second of those two accounts. This particular text is chosen intentionally for the first Sunday in Lent and is paired with the gospel narrative of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness by the devil, perhaps for obvious reasons. Jesus is successful in his battle with temptation against the devil, while Adam and Eve fail in their similar battle against the serpent. In an overall sense, then, Jesus is actually reversing the order of the state of creation by conquering what Adam and Eve could not. Our second lesson assigned for today from Paul's letter to the Romans makes it clear. Whereas Adam and Eve fell into temptation, thereby inviting sin followed by death, into the world, and subsequent humanity was enslaved then to sin and to death, Jesus conquered temptation, defeated sin, and cheated death by his resurrection, thereby securing for subsequent humanity the free gift of righteousness and everlasting life. Jesus is doing what our original parents could not, reversing the fall of humankind and restoring and reconciling us back to God. If you think about this text from Genesis more deeply, it is easy to sympathize with Adam and Eve. The text opens up. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. The first charge, duty, or assignment of humanity is to till and keep creation. To benevolently watch over it, making sure that it flourishes. The Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall die. 
Now, everyone in here who has ever interacted with a child knows that the root of temptation comes precisely from such pronouncements. You can do anything you want. Just don't do this one thing. You can go anywhere you want, just not into that room. You can date whomever you want, just not him <laughs> or her. Particularly with children, but also with adults, the loan prohibition you give is the exact thing that intrigues and attracts and piques one's curiosity. That's the definition of taboo, isn't it? The allure or the enticement of what's forbidden. Oftentimes, if and when permission is granted, well, all the fun disappears. Secondly, if this tree is so dangerous, why is it even there? Why does God place it in the garden with Adam in the first place? Couldn't God have just created it some other place or at least put some uncrossable barrier surrounding it? I mean, you don't leave the kitchen with a gas stove on and say to a toddler, by the way, when I'm gone, don't you touch that blue flame over there, do you? <laughs> Thirdly, what makes you think that Adam even understands the penalty of death in the first place? He's just been created. No one else yet exists. He's not even seen so much as a flower die. How can a threat be a deterrent when you don't even know what it means? You can see we're cruising for a bruising quite rapidly here. Now let's go a little deeper. The very next verse which we didn't read because it's outside of our assigned text, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper as his partner. Eventually, in verse 21, God takes a rib out of Adam's side and creates woman who will eventually be named Eve. So my point is that Eve isn't even around yet when God gave his command not to eat of the fruit of this particular tree. Adam alone received the command because Eve didn't even yet exist. Now, obviously, she's aware of the prohibition by her dialogue with the serpent in chapter 3, but she's only heard about it, presumably and apparently, secondhand from Adam, as opposed to firsthand from God. So that at least possibly dilutes the force of it. Furthermore, some biblical translations, some ancient biblical translations, leave out the phrase from verse 6, who was with her, leading many scholars to post that Adam wasn't even around when this original temptation occurred at the hands of the serpent. That is not to exculpate Adam from any guilt. He certainly ate of it either then or later. But it is to suggest that the one who directly heard and received the divine command perhaps would have been more reluctant to yield than someone for whom the command was hearsay. And to add to your exasperation, what is the serpent even doing there in the first place? Where did he come from? What kind of garden is this? Ugh. I don't know. There are some unsavory elements in this account. And finally, when Eve succumbs in verse number 6 based on three things, number one, the tree is good for food, number two, it was a delight to the eyes, and number three, it was desire to make one wise, two of those threes hearken back to chapter 2, verse 9, wherein God purposely designs the trees of the garden to be, and I quote, pleasant to the sight and good for food. <laughs> I'm starting to admire Adam and Eve for holding off as long as they did. I probably would have succumbed much sooner. <laughs> Let's transition, shall we? It's done. The so-called fall of humankind, wherein sin and death enter the world, follows by one mere chapter, a creation about which the biblical author can write, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was good. Actually, I'm sorry, very good. Notice the location of this particular tree in the garden, my friends. According to chapter 3, verse 3, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is where? 
in the middle of the garden. Its location is central, central to everything else. That's sad, isn't it? You get the sense that once the middle is messed up, everything else will be messed up. Once the core is violated, becomes rotten, everything else becomes corrupt too. Once your soul's relationship to God is severed, it makes sense that the rest of your life would fall apart or become empty. Ironically enough, the serpent told the truth in one way. He says in verse 5, your eyes will be opened. And in verse 7, the eyes of both were opened. But rather than opened in wisdom, they are opened in shame. They knew that they were naked, and so they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Apart from its literal meaning, being naked metaphorically means being weak, vulnerable, and helpless. Does anyone in here this morning know what it's like to be weak, vulnerable, helpless? To have to sew fig leaves together to mask certain things? To have to disguise and hide behind your guilt, your shame, the way you really are. Because if the truth ever came out, it would have devastating and catastrophic consequences. And so we hide ourselves from God and from each other. Do you know what I consider the chief irony in this text, my friends? Verse 5 of chapter 3, the middle part of the serpent's temptation. Your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. Some say that's the real heart of the temptation, to be like The reason that's ironic, chapter 1, verses 26 and 27, then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. I want to be like God, yet I'm already created in God's likeness. I want to be God-like, and yet I'm already created like God. They are being tempted with something they already possess. They are already, as is, created in the image of God and in His likeness. You know what illustration or metaphor the earliest church fathers used for sin they said sin was like a dog with a piece of meat in its mouth running beside a stream of water who stops and sees its reflection in the water and opens its mouth to acquire the meat it sees in the reflection in the water thereby dropping the real meat in its possession for a futile attempt at an unreal reflection in the water being tempted with something you already possess. How can the devil tempt us with something we already have? How can the serpent tempt us with being someone or something we already are? How can you tempt us with being like God when we're already made in his likeness? That's like offering me a hundred pennies when I've got a dollar bill in my pocket. That's like offering to take me to the movies when I've already seen it. How can we be tempted with love when we are already loved? How can we be tempted with acceptance when we are already accepted? How can we be tempted with excitement when we are already joyful? 
How can we be tempted to security, however that's defined, when God says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all the rest shall be added unto you. And your heavenly Father knows what you need before you even ask Him. How can you tempt me to a better life when I've already received life more abundantly? How can you play on my fear of death when I already know that death has no sting? It has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is thy sting? Where, O death, is thy victory? How can you tempt us with a tree when you and I already are trees? Planted by streams of water, Psalm 1 says of us, which yield our fruit in season. Our leaves do not wither, and all that we do we prosper. You and I, my friends, were created very good. In the image and likeness of God, we were created. And yes, we fell into sin and as a result, into death. But Jesus Christ has come. He has lived, died, and been resurrected and promised to come again, not to deceive us with false hope or illusory dreams, but to redeem us, to restore us, and to reconcile us back to God, to confer upon us the gift of his own righteousness, exchange yokes with us that we might have rest for our souls and bestow upon us his peace which passes all understanding. None of those are empty cliches or hollow platitudes, but they are very real promises of God. So we can sing along and believe along with that old gospel song, I told Satan, get thee behind, victory today is mine. But it's not yours because of your own strength or fortitude. It's not yours because you will successfully battle temptation from here on out in your life. Victory is yours because of Jesus. When you are weak, He is strong. When you fall short, He achieves. When you drop exhausted, He perseveres. When you, are, when you see nothing but sin, He forgives. When you loathe yourself, He loves you unconditionally. Comparing Adam to Christ, what does Paul say in our Romans reading assigned for today? Just as one man's trespass, Adam's, led to condemnation for all, so too one man's act of righteousness Righteousness, Jesus, is, leads to justification and life for all. You do not face the devil or his agents of temptation unassisted this Lenten season. The outcome is not in debate or doubt. Some of your efforts will be strong and valiant. Others will be weak and woeful. But because Christ has conquered, you, my friend, are victorious. That's eyes truly open. Eyes truly Amen. Amen. Your support of our ministries here at St. Philip is greatly appreciated. You enable us to carry on our mission. You may make donations at uh, stphilip.org. You can mail it in or there is a plate at the back. Thank you.
But we're fighting for what we already have received. We are, we are, we're caught in the in-between, but we're fighting for what we already have received. as we sing our profession of faith. We celebrate together now the Lord's Supper, the Feast of Holy Communion. Scripture tells us that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, 
Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together, let us pray as Jesus asks us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the distribution. After we commune the worship and praise band, we will invite you to form a single file line down the center aisle to come and receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of all your sins and the gift of eternal life.
please rise and receive our post-communal blessing. And now may the eating of Christ's body and the drinking of his blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, lover of all, in this sacrament we are one family in Christ your Son, one in the sharing of his body and blood, and one in the communion with his Spirit. Help us to grow in love for one another and come to the full maturity of the body of Christ. We make our prayer through your Son, our Savior. Amen. Siblings in Christ, what is our purpose? Jesus, Jesus asked, asked that we love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our soul and with all our mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. Jesus tells us that a second is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. We answer that call and we go out to share the love of Christ. Amen. Go now and live in the spirit of your baptism, even when you are led into the wild and hard places. With repentance and trust, give yourselves to God with fasting and prayer. Strengthen yourselves against the way of the tempter, and may God enfold you in tender and lasting love. We go, we go in, in peace, peace to love and serve the Lord. In, In the, the name, name of Christ, Christ. Amen. Amen.
And all will see how great, how great is our God. Go in peace with eyes wide open to know that you were created just how you are to be. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.